the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the IGC, the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. I want to say thanks again for subscribing, sharing, getting the word out through social media, email, uh, rating us on iTunes and Stitcher, all those comments on YouTube, everything. We really appreciate it out there. If you have some time and you're thinking about doing some shopping for the holiday season or whenever, uh, you can head on over to our support page at intellectualgentlemensclub.com. We have our affiliate sponsors on there for Amazon, Onnit, and Audible.com. There's also a PayPal button in there. You can donate right through there. Again, thank you to Renault Video Productions. Uh, they sponsored this podcast as well. Really appreciate the support from them. Um, go ahead and check them out at RenaultVP.com for all your video production needs. This week I spoke with a member of Speak Thunder Films, uh, Christopher Carson Smith. He is a documentary editor and director. He studied cinematography and producing at the Sydney Film School in Australia. He also holds a master's degree in public administration, a BA in philosophy, and a certificate in nonprofit management. We had an interesting conversation. We're going to be talking about his film called Tiny, and uh, it is a documentary film that is uh, inspired by Living Tiny. Christopher decided to chase one of his dreams and make a documentary film in the process. Uh, Tiny, a story about living small, is a product of that journey. Not only does it chronicle the events set in motion for building a tiny house, but it also provides interviews with other tiny housers. It's really, uh, really pretty interesting. Um, Chris and I talk about the ever-changing American dream, some issues with materialism and consumerism, and the therapeutic nature of making things, uh, similar to what Wendy Tremaine talked about with us. Uh, we also discussed some challenges behind the building process and how living in 100 to 500 square feet or so can change one's perceptions on the world. You can hear a trailer here for the movie Tiny, and after that, we're going to launch right into the interview. Hope you guys enjoy the episode. In a few months, I'll be 30 years old. And for the first time, I'm thinking about putting down roots. So I ask myself, what makes a good home? Since 1970, the average house size in the United States has doubled. But for some people, bigger isn't necessarily better. I heard about these people who live in tiny houses. I wanted to know more. You know, I, I guess the primary asset that comes with a small house is freedom. It's really just uh, the world gets a lot bigger when you're living small because I can, uh, I can afford to do a lot more things now in terms of both cash and time. Visiting other small homes inspired me to simplify my own life. I set out to build a tiny house and establish a place in the mountains. Drill bit. Hangers. What are you most worried about with the tiny house? Well, I'm really worried about finishing the tiny house. This project is harder than I expected. I've never built anything before. I don't know yet if I can live with Christopher in a tiny house. But I think it will be worth it. The interesting thing about the tiny house movement is, is whether we can um, turn it into an innovation. We don't all have to give up all our material possessions and live in 89 square feet. But let's think about maybe giving up our McMansions and, and building a little smarter. Welcome back to the IGC, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to be speaking with uh, one of the members of Speak Thunder Films. His name is Christopher Smith. How are you, Christopher? I'm pretty good. 
So we're here to talk about the documentary that you uh, made with Marette Mueller, uh, Tiny. Uh, I played a trailer before the interview started here, and I think everybody has kind of got an idea Um, about what, what everything's about. So what got you started in this crazy idea of building a tiny house? I don't, I, let me take that back. I don't think it's a crazy idea, but what started you on that path where it's something that you wanted to do? Well, about, uh, right about the time I was finishing up grad school, you know, I, I was sort of reevaluating kind of what I was doing with my life and I was about to turn 30. So I was thinking about what was important to me and then what I wanted to do next and, you know, I knew that at some point in my life, I, I had this dream of, you know, buying some property up the mountains and building a cabin on it. And it occurred to me, you know, I'd been putting it off for a long time and and actually putting it off isn't the right word. I think that we all have these dreams that we're going to do someday. And it occurred to me that why, why wait for it to be someday? You know, I just worked really hard and worked my way through school. If I put that amount of effort in toward, towards making, that long-term dream come true sooner, you know, I could probably make it happen just like I, you know, w- made school happen. So uh, with that sort of logic in place, I, I just uh, kind of on a whim looked into what it would take to buy some land in the mountains. And it actually ended up being um, something I could afford and, uh, and a lot easier than I realized. So within a week, I think I had put an offer down on some land. Uh, and once that was in place, you know, I, I, the next step was, you know, building the house and, you know, I, I called the building department to see about permits for, you know, a three or 400 square foot house. Cause that's what seemed feasible to me to build. But, uh, it turns out that you can't actually build houses that size. I was amazed um, to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, I was too. It's, it's really shocking actually that, um, you know, there's a, a minimum house size and not a maximum in most cases. So, so uh, let me, I'm sorry, let me back up just a little bit, but you chose Hartsell, Colorado, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm pretty familiar with Colorado. I drove around the state a lot. I lived there for a couple of years. It's my home away from home. I love the mountains there. Love Hartsell. What, what drew you to that area specifically? Well, you know, I, I've been in Colorado off and on for like 13 or 14 years. And, you know, I love pretty much anywhere on the mountains and I would have been mm-hmm. happy finding land just about anywhere. But, you know, South Park, that area is particularly beautiful. And it's also relatively close to the Denver metro area, just about two hours southeast of Denver. So got a lot of um, nice the peaks around there as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. And, and the land is actually pretty affordable in that area because, uh, you know, it's not really that close to anything <laughs> no ski resorts uh, or anything like that yeah exactly exactly and it's really high at altitude so agriculturally speaking there's not a lot you can do with it either it's about nine thousand feet there or something right yeah that's about right okay yeah. so you nope. started investigating on on how to get this house built they're saying that you can't build anything that small so the logical next step was to do what <laughs> you know, um, back in 2009, so a couple years before this, I had my mom just randomly sent me a copy of Yes magazine that had a cover story about a woman named Dee Williams, who um, later we went and interviewed for our film, mm-hmm. who was living in a tiny house. So it was at this point that it that I made that connection that oh, you know, the reason that they build these tiny houses on trailer beds is because then it doesn't fall under the housing codes. It is kind of... It's like an RV, right? Yeah, it's like an RV. Okay. Exactly. What is the difference basically between uh, going to buy an RV that's already basically kind of like a tiny house and building your own? I mean, I know you wanted to build something your own. Do you think it's more affordable to just purchase an RV and live like that? Or what was what was the major benefits of building it yourself? Obviously, you, you tailor it to what you want exactly. But why do people build tiny houses instead of uh, just going to pick up a basic RV? You know, um, RVs actually, when you buy them new or or relatively new, they're not that cheap, really. You know, they're they're actually not that different than building your own tiny house, although you don't have to spend a year doing it. (laughs) True. Um, (laughs) Are they are they built? They're probably not built as well as some something uh, that you would build like a tiny house. Yeah. 
Yeah, another surprising thing that I think a lot of people don't know is that RVs, by law, if I'm, and I might be mistaken here, but I'm, but I've heard this that um, that they're recreational vehicles, and so they're they kind of have to only be suitable to be used three, you know, three seasons a year. So they're not very well insulated. Sure, and they're not designed to live in full time. And I think part of it is that they don't want people living full time. Um, and this ties in with the same laws about minimum house sizes where, you know, the, the government's really concerned about people living in unsanitary and unsafe environments. And uh, I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at it from that perspective, the housing codes make sense. And also, you know, not wanting people to live in RVs. Um, but, you know, I think the main difference between an RV and a tiny house is really just the feeling you get being in them. A uh, tiny house really feels like a house that feels solid. It has a good atmosphere and a good vibe. And it, More like you know, a home, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, in an RV, it just feels very manu- – most of the time, uh, I've seen some pretty nice RVs, but most of the time it feels very manufactured. It feels more temporary, and uh, it's often not built to the same kind of standards and quality and doesn't have the same insulation as a tiny house would. Also, uh, let me just add here that, you know, what's interesting about tiny houses and what makes them accessible for people is the way they look. So – Aesthetically, you know, people don't can't picture themselves living in an RV because you know there's a lot of ne- negative stereotypes with trailer homes. Sure, and RVs. sure, I get it. Yeah, but like a tiny house, they're really cute and they're really accessible, and they challenge our idea of what a, a house on a trailer or even like a really small house is. It's no longer um, about it's not, you know it's no longer something that you have to do and just you know it it you're because you can't afford anything bigger. It's now its own thing that's designed well and beautiful and that people desire to live in. I mean, the, the design that you came up with, I've, I've seen the film like three times now. So the design that you came up with for the tiny house looks really cool. I mean, it's got that really high peak. There's like a loft area that you've designed. Um, <laughs> it's like all wooden inside. You got the, you know, the panels on the walls and everything look really cool. Like the tongue and tongue and groove. <laughs> Thanks. So where did you come up with the design? Is it something that you designed yourself or did you largely look on the internet for basically build prints or how did that go happen? Yeah. So the, I, uh, you know, the whole sort of desire to build it myself, you know, that came out of this, this sort of, I think kind of a primitive instinct to, to like, you know, build something and create something from the ground up. Cause you know, my, a lot of my work up until this point had been very, you know, based in an office in front of a computer. And I just kept having this urge to get out and do something with my hands and, uh, included in that, you know, or I thought in order to, to really have that sense of achievement and accomplish it, I really needed to de- also design it myself, mm-hmm. um, rather than buying plans and having it spelled out for me. It was, for me, it was this journey of, learning how and figuring out how to build a house and doing it all myself as best I could. So the design, you know, it is, it is quote unquote my design, but I borrowed heavily from inspiration from other people who have tiny houses who had built them before me and they had their um, builds either, you know, pictures of it online or they shared information. Um, so I had a pretty good foundation to work off of when, you know, my, doing my design, but you know, I got to say that my de- my design's pretty simple. It's you know, I drew a floor floor plan and then just figured the rest out as I went along. So it's not like you know, there's some intense architectural you know design <laughs> sketch ups out there of my house, but um, but you know, uh, I kind of went for the a cabin meets industrial look. So there's a lot of industrial finishes, but you know, there's also a lot of that traditional cabin. Uh, design and iconography kind of built into it. So you got the the wood and organic stuff juxtaposed with metal you know, roof, industrial and the, right. metal roof, industrial lights, things like that. So I think there's like I, I've had other people on the podcast where they talk about uh, making things instead of being in this culture of materialism and consumerism. Mm. Um, I know you had to purchase lumber and different things for the tiny house, but did you use any recycled materials for it? Oh, definitely. You know, I would. How much of the house would you say? Hmm. You know, sadly, I think only probably about twenty percent of the house was recycled materials. Still pretty good. Right. You say about twenty percent. That's that's still a pretty good number. 
Yeah, no, 20% is not bad. You know, there are lots of people who are up near 100% even or, or much higher. But, um, you know, there's the thing is there, you can have recycled materials. You can, you can build it quickly and you can build it cheaply, but you can't do all three of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had to sort of choose two. And because we were making a movie, uh, I kind of opted for quickly and as cheaply as possible because I was trying to earn money as I went along. Um, and so unfortunately I had to, I had to compromise a little bit on the recycled materials because, you know, recycled materials, a lot of times you can get them, um, cheaply, but you have to go do the labor yourself, like remove flooring from someone else's house and they'll give it to you. Right. Or you have to be able to wait and find it as it comes up on Craigslist. Um, and so it takes a certain amount of patience and yeah, and looking and I didn't have time for all that, unfortunately, but I did, um, the very obvious things that you can do to, you know, re- that are reclaimed materials are the windows are pretty easy to find and flooring um, and sometimes insulation. You know, those those uh, were pretty easy for me to come by. It was things like two by fours, which, believe it or not, are, are the hardest thing to find reclaimed because they usually when they come out of buildings, they're usually damaged or they're not long enough. And you kind of need, you know, a pretty long length and you need a lot of it. Yeah, it's your primary structure material, so you need to really have a sound skeleton, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. So, what kind of experience did you have with tools? I, it doesn't seem you mentioned you're an office guy. You probably didn't have a whole lot of experience with tools. So, I see that you you had your trusty iPhone with you a lot of time, YouTube and stuff. It's it's exactly what I do. I probably most of the population does too. If you don't know something, the world's at our fingertips now. So, it, is that kind of your style, or how did how did you? <laughs> tackle all that with the tools yeah you know i'm not i hadn't didn't have any building experience before and moret certainly didn't have any building experience um either and uh so you know i certainly had to figure out a lot as i i went and youtube was an invaluable resource and in fact it kind of put me in this habit where now i i google and youtube everything Mm -hmm. because literally everything that you need to know about somebody for whatever reason has written about it on the internet or even created a how-to video uh, so it's incredible, like the, the amount of information that our generation has at our fingertips and not even at your computer, but when you're out on this field building a house, you can really <laughs> just pull out your phone and, and learn how to do something. It's incredible. Um, but yeah, you know, I think part of the reason it took me so long to build the house was that I would spend about a third of my time learning how to do the thing I was about to do. And then two thirds of the time doing it. So it was every day. It was kind of this routine where I'd go to home Depot, buy the right materials, talk to some people, look it up, go out there, actually do it. And then the next day start over. Not a bad way to go for somebody who doesn't have uh, much building experience, right? Yeah. I, sorry. I think you cut out there for a second. Um, I didn't hear what you, what you just said. I just, uh, you know, as far as someone who didn't have much building experience, mm-hmm. that's probably the only thing you probably could have done really. That's true. So how did I mean with with every day you're building this and you have the camera set up and things like that? How did you guys have time? Because I know Moret worked on it pretty heavily with you. How did you guys have time to go and do these interviews with other tiny housers and get the work done and do all this? I mean, you mentioned in in the uh, in the documentary that it takes you a lot longer than you think it's going to. I mean, you originally thought it was going to be, what, three or three or months or so, but it ended up taking over a year, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, the way that it kind of unfolded and um, partially planned and partially not planned, we, you know, we didn't really realize we were making uh, this film and a film that would do as well as it's ended up doing or that it would be as long as it is. So, you know, we were we were filming out a lot out on the side and building and then you know, when we, whenever we had a, a trip planned somewhere, we did some research about, you know, tiny house people who might be in the area. This is kind of in the early days. And then we would, you know, interview them when we were uh, when already on a, a trip that we had planned. And then, you know, um, as the prog- progress of the film, you know, went on, we, we actually planned a few trips as well. But the thing is, is that, you know, I didn't – there were plenty of times in that year where I wasn't building because I didn't, I ran out of money. Right. And while it still costs money to go travel and film people, 
um, you know, is we were just basically buying plane tickets and, you know, we would stay with friends and stuff. So that was actually a lot cheaper than, you know, buying a couple thousand dollars worth of materials to, to build the next step. So, you know, some of those breaks were actually fortunate for our film in that it gave us time to focus on more of the filmmaking aspects. So out of all the people that you did interview in the film, and there are quite a few um, great people, might I add, uh, what did you learn from them collectively? Yeah, there's, there's, you know, lots of people in the film, but there's also a, a number of people who, you know, unfortunately didn't make the final cut of the film. So it was a really great experience to country and go to all these different places where people were kind of on the same journey. But building my own tiny house, being inside theirs and so many examples of what a tiny house was, it gave me a lot of inspiration and helped me learn a lot. And I got to ask their advice about things. You know, it was really, um, it was an advantage that not, not all tiny house uh, builders who are building their own house are really have that opportunity. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I also learned just kind of about the motivations of, or, or we did um, the motivations of what, why people are downsizing. And, you know, there seems to be this underlying growing realization all over the country and probably all over the world about, you know, reevaluating what's important in life. And, you know, if, if stuff, or experiences or people like what matters the most and how do we incorporate those values into our daily lives and into our homes that we live in. And, uh, it's really interesting. It's, it's almost like, a, you know, like the, the, an awakening, awakening of sorts. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, we have these periods in, the, in history where, um, there are big shifts in people's thinking and consciousness. And I think that in a lot of ways, we're going through one of those right now with I local right. yeah. food stuff and, and, you know, um, trends towards artisanal um, products rather than mass produced products. So I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about, about that shift. So a question that I have, and, and this kept coming over and over my mind as I was watching the film, especially the first time I watched it was, Man, this seems like so ideal to just kind of downsize, get in, get rid of all your stuff that you don't need. It seems like, you know, there's people in the in the in the film that mention, you know, do you what are you happy about? Do, are you do you want to live in this big house and have this job you hate to buy shit you don't need? You know, <laughs> it's got a lot of these Fight Club, you know, little <laughs> little tidbits in it as well. No one's ever made that comparison, but I <laughs> well, I have. <laughs> No, that was that was really in my forefront, you know, and uh, I think there's there's got to be a difference between if you're looking to build a tiny house for yourself, if you're building a tiny house for yourself and your partner, and then the game really has got to change a lot when you have children. Mm -hmm. I have two kids right now, almost 10 and 13, and it would have been way easier to transition into my normal suburban life now into like a tiny house environment when they were much younger, that's provided my wife would be into it, which I don't think she is. But, <laughs> um, how did you, I mean, you did talk with at least one person I saw in the film that had kids. He was a tiny house builder. Um, it seems like he had upgraded, you know, at least once during his family's growth. So do you think it's, uh, do you think it's realistic that people could raise kids in a tiny house? You know, there's a number of, of uh, um, there's a number of families who live in tiny houses. Uh, although I, I do think it's significantly harder. And you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, what this really gets at is what what's the definition of a tiny house? And uh, you know, the the thing is, is that we've chosen our film to focus on these extreme examples of small spaces, primarily because it's captivating and interesting, mm -hmm. and it really does a good job of illustrating the point. But at the end of the day, not everybody is suited or should live in a tiny house. What we were mainly trying to raise was a few points, which is one, if people want to do it, there should be the structure in place to allow them to do it. Two, if, um, you know, it, uh, down, so, uh, what, you know, the, the things that tiny houses bring up, the values and the questions that they raise are really important for everybody, I think, to think about or at least consider. And then also, you know, the, the thing is, it's not about trying to cram yourself into the smallest space possible. It's more just about asking yourself those questions and then 
incorporating them into your life in the best way possible. And so for a family, you know, you can downsize, you know, your family into 700 square feet and it might feel like a tiny house. You know, I mean, it's, it's not about living in a small space. It's just about, you know, having as much as you need without necessarily having tons extra, you know, and, and, and with all the burden that comes with that. So really it's a personal choice. We just hope that people are, it is a choice and they're not just defaulting to what cultural uh, norms are. I think that's very easy to fall into. You make a good point of, you know, falling into cultural norms. Um, you know, people are mentioned in the film about McMansions and, you know, that, that people, you know, maybe every, it's not cut out for everybody, but, you know, let's at least think about, you know, d- downsizing a little bit. I just think that it's, it's, I used to work in a lot of people's houses. I used to um, run wiring in people's homes and I was in and out of four to five, six houses a day in varying different areas in the Metro Detroit area and different places throughout the country when I would travel. Uh, but it gave me a unique opportunity to see how people live, uh, the type of spaces they were in. I was able to kind of tell a lot about a person by the space that they live in. And I, I found it just kind of mind numbing to go into a, a very affluent area and there would be just two people living in a house that's like 30,000 square feet. It just, mm-hmm. to me, it was just so ridiculous. Like, you know, I live in a, uh, we're about a thousand square feet with a basement and, you know, it's almost a full-time job keeping this place, you know, <laughs> keeping this place clean. It's like, there's, unless you want to hire somebody, you know, to keep up on your property, exactly, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, there's also the, on the other coin, you know, the other side of the coin, you have, uh, issues with privacy, like. We moved to a little bit bigger house so we could have a little bit more space. The kids were getting older. The basement really kind of opened everything up. I mean, it's it's largely an unfinished area that I'm working on. That's where I have my office, my studio, all, all that stuff is in the basement. Um, but a lot of people, myself included, value their privacy a lot. And it, they need space to basically get away, especially when drama gets real heated. You know, I told you I have a wife and kids, so you can imagine <laughs> what that's like sometimes. So how do people get away when they need to get away in these type of smaller areas when, you know, it's, they're, you know, 50, not even 50 feet, you know, you're, you know, within five feet of each other. How do you get away and get your privacy? Well, I, we've heard from a lot of people that, you know, live in them as couples or a family that there are two, there are two things really. One, you know, you can go for a walk. And what's great about tiny houses and, and the fact that they're small is that you externalize a lot of the features of home. Mm-hmm. And that includes your privacy. So, you know, if you really need to be alone, you know, you might go for a walk or you might go to the coffee shop and read a book or the library or the gym or all sorts of places. Um, or some people are just, you know, they'll use this space well in, in, in the sense that they might go up to the loft and put on their headphones. And that's, you know, creates the feeling of privacy. Mm-hmm. But ultimately at the end of the day, what I think is really interesting about tiny houses is that it really forces us as uh, people and as family units to have to communicate with each other in a way that you don't have to, when you can get away um, easier. So, you know, it, it, Oh man, that means you got to work on relationships and <laughs> shit, man. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's hard, but it's, more, I think, rewarding in the end yeah, when, yeah. you know, you develop those skills. And uh, and I think it's interesting. I wonder, I, I don't know this, but I wonder if, you know, people who used to live tiny and then upgrade if they were, would ever miss that. I, pro- I would imagine there's probably not a lot of people that go up once you go down. <laughs> um, I can imagine. You bring up a, a, an interesting point when you talk about numbers, like what are the percentages and stuff, but... I wonder what the percentages of happy people living in tiny homes compared to the percentage of happy people living in a normal, quote, suburban home, um, what the divorce rates might be, things like that. I, do you think that the people that you've interviewed are generally happier people than the people you meet in normal, in traditional society, I guess you'd say? You know, I think that's a tough question because I think at the end of the day, you know, your your house doesn't play as much of a role in your happiness as your general attitude towards life and your relationships and your perception of 
belonging and doing worthwhile things and all of that. But I would say that what a house does is it enables you to pursue the things that matter to you. It enables you to pursue spending more time with friends and family because you're spending less time working. Yeah, that's man, that, that's something that's very enticing to me, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, and we we encountered that over and over again, you know, just people not worrying about bills and and having more the flexibility to take vacations or work jobs that they like rather than jobs that pay well. Um those types of things I think do impact your happiness, but it's not the house itself, it's just the lifestyle that it enables you. That makes a lot of sense. So do you think that uh a tiny house can live alongside the American dream. Well, I think what our film really is, and uh, you know what this trend we were talking about earlier reflects, is that it's a, a redefining of what the American dream is. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that tiny houses live alongside the American dream. I think it's a new American dream where you know our values are, are focused more on you know quality versus quantity. Um, having a good life and that good life doesn't necessarily revolve around just having a lot of money. It revolves around, revolves around um, leading fulfilling lives with people we care about and uh, doing things that, you know, are rewarding like it um, and things that we're passionate about. And I think that the younger generation, you know, because our parents have uh, paved the way with, you know, working really hard and providing us, the opportunity to, you know, have all, you know, education and things like that. We're in this position now where we really get to um, take a step back and then choose what kind of lifestyle we, we want. And I think that that's why our sort of our generation is leading the way on this shift in a lot of respects, because, um, because we have that foundation. Um, and I hate to say, but sort of the affluence of the previous generation and what they, what they kind of gave us to, now we have that choice instead of just surviving, we have a choice to like, now what do we want life to mean or what it to look like? So, I mean, I think that's a pretty good segue to come into uh, how your family handled all this. It seems like they were kind of surprised at the very end where they come in and they're helping out, like kind of finish up the tiny house when you have it on the land where you're building. Um, but in the mm -hmm. beginning, it seems like, you know, you're interviewing them around the dinner table. It seems like, ah, it's kind of a crazy idea. Like, I, you know, I might want to live in a tiny house, but I'm scared of what my neighbors would think. Do you think that a lot of people have a fear of downsizing just for the fact of how society sees them at large? Definitely. I think less so than, than maybe even 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, my, I think my family is a really good example. My mom and her partner just moved into a small house in Portland, Oregon, and it's beautiful, really cool house, two bedrooms, but it is kind of small. And but there's only two of them, but it's still, you know, maybe 1500 square feet. And uh, and they're like constantly, oh, we, it's just too small. We need more room. And, <laughs> and it's just like, I'm like, I'm like, mom, you know, I did you learn nothing from my film? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think that there's just like a slightly different mentality um, with, with with them in that generation, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just, you know, freedom to them re uh, resembled, have you know. Having more? Yeah, exactly. It was like manifested by like what, what you were able to, to buy because, you know, my mom was raised by her parents, you know, who remember the Depression quite well and mm -hmm. and. They didn't have a lot of money. So, you know, I think that a lot of times love was expressed through giving things because those things meant a lot more. Whereas these days, you know, you can give like uh, some, you know, knickknack or thing for like bought on Amazon, but it doesn't mean as much because that, that it didn't cost as much to the person to give that, you know. Um, and when you're talking so, about costs, you're not talking about necessarily just financial costs, but exactly. there's a cost associated with dollars, like what, how hard you have to work and the time exactly. and effort you have to put into making that dollar to be able to purchase that materialistic item to give to somebody. I, exactly. I, I follow you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, yeah, sorry if that wasn't clear. But yeah. And so I don't know. I just think, you know, they're a pretty good example of kind of like the older model um, and then, you know, but the millennials, you know, we are way more transient. We oftentimes end up in, um, 
you know, new situations and we want to experience new things. And, you know, having um, a house in that sort of, it just kind of ties you down, you know. It seems and, like uh, what you're talking about the newer generation is more into experience based rather than financial based or security based. Totally. And, and in a weird way, I, I feel like maybe even a little more existential. Mm -hmm. Like, for sure. Asking, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, asking a little bit more, like, bigger questions. Thinking a little bit deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised, not, 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 the, I'm surprised at how many younger listeners I have to the show. Um, some people reach out to me sometimes, and it's it's pretty incredible because I'm getting older now. I'm, you know, I just turned 37, and I, I keep looking back at, like, high school, and these kids are looking younger and younger and younger. <laughs> and it just, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that. But there's – I think there's definitely a shift that's happening, and it is a generational factor. I mean, you talk about growing up uh, when you're a kid, you were in a military family, did a lot of traveling, moving around. Do you think that had a lot to do with um, wanting to do something like that? Yeah, it did. Because for me, and, and I think maybe this is what I was getting at, at that point in the film, is that, you know, I still travel around a lot. In fact, I'm in having this conversation with you from L.A. where I'm working on my next project. So I'm not even in my tiny house at the moment. Um but I kind of knew that about myself and that that's what my life would be like. And so for me, the, the tiny house project, you know, more the house in the film was about having a place uh, in the mountains that would always be there, no matter where I lived, that I could go visit or I could, you know, it would be in my consciousness as like my place. Um, and I think that, you know, cause I don't really have that right now. When I look back at my childhood and, you know, all the, the traveling different places we lived, there wasn't like one house, you know, that was, that's home. And, uh, you know, in, in part of that was that my parents got divorced at an early age. And so I was always kind of back and forth between both their houses and they would both move like every other year or so. So I was kind of constantly adjusting to a new space. So I didn't have that kind of attachment or sense of place that a lot of people do who grow up in a, in a, you know, single family home, the same one, like their whole lives. So, mm -hmm. um, so I guess it was kind of partially me trying to create that experience you know, moving forward. Um, and it was also partially just that I love the mountains and, you know, all the travel I did with my dad, he would always take us around the West to see all these beautiful places. And, you know, I wanted to have, um, you know, sad as it sounds, a little piece of that for myself, but I wanted to do it in a way that didn't impact the very thing that I loved, which is that sort of solitude in the, in the landscape. So I wanted something that was very light on the land. So in Hartsville, Colorado, there's not a lot of, uh, utility base uh out there in the middle of nowhere so i'm, I'm obviously you built a self-sustaining type of facility or kind of living off the grid mm -hmm. what was your infrastructure like yeah exactly part of the reason the land was so affordable is that there's no utilities so in um in anywhere in colorado you have the right to drill a well so that was always a possibility but drilling a well is um it's expensive and they can't even tell you how much it's going to be because it depends on how deep the water is. Isn't there something with mineral rights out there too? I thought that especially up in mountain towns from when I lived out there, this is going back, you know, six, seven years, I had talked with residents up there. They said that they didn't have the rights to the water that was on their land or what was underneath it. Mm -hmm. Has something changed since then? Uh, no, that's typically true. So and there's like three things there. There's surface rights, there's mineral rights, and then there's water rights. Okay. And, um, you know, so if you have a river on your land, that doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to use that water. Dam it for, up or whatever. <laughs> totally. So, yeah. um, and then the mineral rights are oftentimes that, you know, they, the people have bought, developers have bought land, separated the surface rights and the mineral rights, and they sell them to different people. And that's so, you know, in Colorado, it's usually oil and gas that comes in and, you know, wants to access the oil mm -hmm. and gas underneath your land. And so you do have to be kind of careful about that. However, um, the area that I bought in, actually, they're sort of exploring for oil and gas relatively close to there. But I kind of think it it's um, not as much of an issue for me just because the parcels are so small. They're only five acres. Uh, you know, and, and, and in order to access those minerals, they would have to basically take over all your land, which is, you know, I'm pretty sure illegal. So, um, so I don't think it's as much of a concern, but yeah, but it, you know, I, there is no water rights with the land, but regardless of surface water rights, 
everyone in Colorado has the right to drill a well into the aquifer um, okay. for household use only. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was a bit, <laughs> a bit of an explanation. <laughs> So, um, what else? What else did you have as far as uh, you know for power, water? Did you? Well, did you? It, you probably didn't drill well as you were talking about. So, did you bring water in? Have it delivered? What were you? How did you survive out there when when you're living in Hartsville? Well, so the plan from the beginning was to to make something that was off grid. Mm -hmm. So, my house, uh, I didn't put plumbing in. It it was a uh, uh, we basically hauled water. So bring in, bring in jugs of water. And then for the toilet, it was a composting toilet. Uh, for the shower, we'd use a solar shower, which is basically just a black bag that heats up in the sun. Right. Yep. <laughs> solar um, thermal, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and then the, the electricity was all run off this thing called uh, – well, it was, it was a solar generator that was self-contained and on wheels in – um, we really like this this option because basically I could wire the house to be plugged into any normal outlet, and you know this way we could use the the solar generator up on the land or anywhere we wanted to, or we could if it was ever near the the grid we could actually just plug into an outlet. So um, it was a really good option, and we worked with this company called uh, Soul Solutions, and they make this thing called the Soul Man, and and uh, it's been great, and you know they. Um, they actually sponsored our film, so uh, big thank you to them for that. Right on. So, Soul Solutions. Uh, I did a little bit of uh, solar work here in Michigan a few years ago, mm -hmm. um, throwing panels on houses, and they were all attached to the grid. So we would use um, microinverters that would take that power and then put it onto the grid. Is that something that it was going through, or were you going through some kind of... Uh, it wasn't a battery backup then. It was something completely different. Well, there's no grid up there, so we couldn't do a grid tie system. It's right, actually yeah. – um, basically what it is is it, it's three panels, and they go into 300-amp-hour batteries, and then they get inverted uh, all in that little cart. So okay. we had just enough energy to um, – basically to power the house – for a night and then it would recharge the next day and if we ran the little fridge that we have in there for four or five days in a row we'd have to kind of unplug it for a while to enable it to charge all the way up but um that's not was that, in, was that in the summer or the winter uh that was in in the winter it's actually kind of both just uh varied the amount of time depending on the summer or winter the, mm -hmm. the, th the thing is solar is um, a really amazing solution I, I actually had never really used it before this experience and and now i'm like convinced that you know that solar should be everywhere i can't believe that it's not i yeah, mean it's me just too. this free energy that just comes down and it works and mm -hmm. um in our case the reason that we've run out is is you know you can really do two things you can either increase the amount of storage or you can increase the amount of solar panels but because we had the self-contained cart thing, it was we were really limited to the amount um, that the cart could hold. So uh, it's a great solution for low power usage situations, which a tiny house is um, or, or can be. But if for people out there who want to build a tiny house and they want to have like a flat panel TV and you know they don't want to use LED bulbs and they want to have like a full size fridge, you can certainly plug into the grid or you could have more panels and uh, still be able to power your tiny house entirely off the grid. Yeah, there's a lot of ground racks you could put. I mean, most of the tiny houses, I don't think, I don't see them putting 50 panels on the roof. <laughs> right. Like, like uh, some yeah. subdivisions you see. But they're not going to use that much either. You sure. Know, I, I think yeah, they could the, get away with five or six and it'd be plenty. Yeah, and you could do a you know a pretty simple ground array. It yep. could get you that. Totally. Um, when I was working out in uh, Colorado, I don't think it was Hartsville, but... Um, somewhere close to Fair Play, there was a place that was totally off the grid. They had their own propane tanks, and that was like the first self-sufficient homestead house that I was ever at. It really blew my socks off. I was really impressed by it. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I used to use this uh, this map program and the GPS that I used to use. I put a I put a dot on my GPS, and that was like my zombie apocalypse escape house. That's where <laughs> I was going to go, and all, that's the fail safe. <laughs> <laughs> but they, it was great. They had, you know, a satellite dish for their TV. They had a satellite dish for their internet. Um, they had a water company that would deliver the water. They had 
uh, solar PV that would uh, take care of all their energy uses, even in the wintertime. They had a lot of uh, panels and battery backups. And then they also had, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, their their hot water system was all solar uh, thermal as well. So mm. it, it, that was like the first opportunity I had to see something that was truly off the grid. I just kind of walked into it cold, didn't know. And, uh, and so they gave me like a, like a tour around the house and how things worked. It was really cool. Do you have anybody come visit the tiny house to do any kind of tours or anything like that? I mean, mm-hmm. tour probably doesn't take very long, but it might be cool to set up shot, have a couple beers or something, you know? Yeah. Um, a lot of people have been inside the tiny house. Uh, before we, the, one of the last scenes of the film, uh, not to give it away, you know, that's spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. Put on your earmuffs if you don't want to hear, uh, <laughs> basically the you know the last kind of sequence is pulling the tiny house up to the land and the day before we did that sequence we actually had an open house in boulder and invited the community to come out and we had you know a couple hundred people that day wow cool and then we also brought it to mountain film a festival in telluride colorado um about a year after we finished building it and then we had i mean hundreds and hundreds of people come through it at that place um and then we've also had some workshops out to the tiny house. You know, Jay Schaefer, who's in the film, his company, Four Lights Tiny Houses, they do uh, workshops. And one of them, the Boulder workshop, came out to the to the house where it is now, which I actually have uh, since moved it back to Boulder. Um, so it's outside of Boulder right now. Um, and so they came out there and saw it. And, yeah, I've had, uh, we've had lots of magazine shoots and newspaper shoots and – uh, an episode of Urban Conversion that's going to be on PBS this year came cool. out, and so yeah, it's it's been quite uh, it's it's been out there a lot. <laughs> that's cool, man. I, I I think it's really cool. I give you a lot of props. It, it 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 wasn't an easy task, I'm sure, to be able to do everything you do, and especially you know with the with the problems that come in as they do with every project. It seemed like you kind of took them in stride. Didn't stress you out too much. I mean, you did. You did. Uh, I'm sure you lost your cool a couple times with the build process, especially you know with your lack of uh, knowledge in building, like we talked about earlier. But um, yeah, I, my hats off to you, you and Moret. It seems like you guys poured your heart into it. You did a fantastic job with the film. Um, so during the film, also Moret, she uh, decided to follow her own passion and move to New York. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, you know Moret uh, deserves. A tremendous amount of credit just for um, supporting, you know, in the early days when I had this crazy idea, it was still just a very crazy idea. Um, yet she encouraged me and supported me and even was uh, the one who was sort of like, well, why don't you make a f- film about the tiny house? And so, um, you know, from the beginning, she was really supportive and that was incredibly helpful for me personally. And then as I started, you know, six months in struggling she came out, you know, every day and started working on the house with me. And that was amazing too, because, you know, for her, she never really wanted to build a house. And, uh, um, she was sort of fascinated by the issues that brought up about home and, and how, how we create it. But, you know, she, she really took on that, um, job of, of like being a builder and, and in stride and, and like worked really hard and took, took the project on as her own. And so, you know, for that, I'll always be grateful. Um, but yeah, ever since I've known her, she wanted to live in New York. And so, you know, she kind of through this process, I think it got her asking questions about, you know, what's right for her and what's the right place to be and what are her dreams that she wants to pursue. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and and it it was sort of, it was interesting, uh, to kind of go on that journey together. And, you know, after sort of to bring up your listeners up to where things are today after the end of the film, we ended up, you know, moving the house up to the land, staying in it for a little bit. And then we moved to New York where we did post-production on the film. And, uh, we both lived there for about a year. And then we started traveling around to film festivals with the film. And, uh, we kind of went our separate ways and I ended up back in Colorado and, moved the tiny house back to Boulder so I could stay in it in between trips. And I ended up living in the tiny house for about a year and a half. Um, Moret and I still, you know, are very close and we keep in touch daily and we have this film out there, which is kind of like, you know, a baby pretty much that we <laughs> You've nurtured <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We have joint custody over, over this project. So, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so, and we have this amazing thing that we created, which were two amazing things, really, a house and a film. So uh, it was a really special experience, and it really taught me a lot about the things that I want out of life and also how to, like, you know, empower the people in my life to achieve the things that they want out of life. So if you had to do it all over again, what type of changes would you make, if any? No, um, that maybe that's a whole different podcast. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, not necessarily, but you know, there is a lot for sure. You know, a lot of them are minor, but um, in terms of the house, I probably would. You know, the, the when I started building the house and designed it, there wasn't a lot of exam- as many examples to choose from as there are today. People have done some amazing things with tiny houses since that time. And when and, did you when did you start building the tiny house? Sorry. Um, no problem. I, I started building in the spring of 2011. Okay. So, you know, and I think tiny houses really exploded probably a year later. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a good time to get your film on the market, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know um, it's just really incredible the creativity that people have in these new designs. And I would probably borrow some ideas from a lot of them. Um, I think the things that I find the hardest about my house are – uh, primarily the fact that I didn't put running water in. Um, when it came back to Boulder and I was living in it full time, I really missed the convenience of running water. And just because you live small doesn't mean you have to live, you know, without running water and without electricity. Right. And I wish I had a little more foresight and, and put the plumbing in anyways, because uh, to, to keep that flexibility of it, having it on grid or off grid. Um, the second thing is just the, I, you know, I have the standard loft with ladder. Um, and these days you see a lot more stairs cases being put in. And I wish I had done something like that um, only because in the middle of the night when you have to pee, it's, you know, negotiating the ladder. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just minor things. And, and then also, uh, you know, in terms of the film, I think if we had known that it was going to be as successful as it turned out to be and we were going to make a feature film, if we knew that from the beginning, we would have probably approached it, um, I hate to say it, but more seriously. And we would have filmed a lot more and we would have maybe even tried to get more funding and do it really proper. Um, you know, I really like the fact that it's got kind of a DIY ethic, but, you know, a lot of the flaws with the film aren't because we necessarily made mistakes. It's just because we set out to make a different thing that changed halfway. So, sure. Well, as everything, you know, so things evolve, right? Right. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, how can people see the film? Where they, can they reach out to you and Marette? So the film is available uh, on iTunes, which uh, you know, you know, if you want to support independent film, that helps us probably the most. Uh, if you buy it there, or you can uh, order a DVD from our website or from our distributor's website, which is uh, our website is tiny themovie dot com. And uh, it's also available on Netflix, and in a month will be available on Hulu. Very cool. Yeah, I was just uh, flipping through Netflix myself, actually, and this is many months ago when we first started talking uh, through email. I, uh, you know, I was just one of those things. I was just uh, kind of bored, looking for stuff to put on my list, and I saw that. I'm like, man, this looks pretty cool. Watched the film, and I was so impressed. I had to reach out, man. So I really appreciate you taking time and uh, talking with me today. Thanks. Um, I should also um, yeah. let me just throw in there also that mm-hmm. uh, internationally, if you have any international listener, listeners, we do. Uh, they can find it on Vimeo on demand, uh, which you know they could link to maybe I think through our website possibly, and it, it's also on iTunes in a number of countries, and they can also order a DVD internationally through our website, and it also um, airs sometimes on. Al Jazeera America in the U S and also on the documentary channel in Canada. Got all kinds of stuff going on, Chris. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. What's, what's <laughs> no, it's good. I, I'd love to hear it. I'd like to see that it's getting so much exposure across all these different uh, areas. Yeah. Uh, what are you working on next? Well, Marette is working on a, uh, a book and she's also producing videos for vice, uh, oh, which nice. Yeah, vice.com. And um, and I've been working on my next uh, feature documentary, which is about uh, how the, the, the U.S. Army during the Cold War experimented with uh, a top-secret psychic espionage program. 
which my father was recruited into and served in for about 10 years and has kind of dedicated his life to. So, Well, dude, when you're ready to put that one out, give me a call because I've got all <laughs> kinds of questions about stuff like that. That's cool. Great. Yeah, definitely. When, uh, when do you think that'll be coming around the corner? Whew. Well, this is a significantly uh, more challenging production than the last one. It's, uh, it's probably a still a good tape, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, red tape. Uh, actually, it's been declassified, so that isn't as hard as the okay. is actually the fundraising because uh, our approach on it is is actually we're coming at it where we want to make uh, it's basically a documentary, but it it has a lot of magical realism elements, which means visual effects, which are really expensive. So it's more of the fundraising uh, that we're having a hard time with. Well, it's, we're not having a hard time. It's just. It just takes more takes time. time. Yeah. yeah. Have you, are you doing a, any kind of crowdfunding, Indiegogo or GoFundMe or anything like that on top of that? You know, I think we might do one um, down the road a little bit. So uh, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, I'll definitely blast it out. People, keep your eyes peeled for those. Cool. All right. Well, Christopher, thank you again for being on the show. Um, I wish you all the best of luck with your future projects. Appreciate the time. Please send uh, well wishes over to Moret. I uh, uh-huh. really enjoyed watching her as well on the film. Um, great. Well, thank you, Jason. It's been been a great conversation. Appreciate it. All right. It. Well, hang loose, Christopher. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. All right, guys. That was the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to let you guys head out here with some wisdom of the elders. Uh, our buddy Joe Rogan is going to bring that one to you this week. If you have some time, please check out our sponsor, Renault Vinyl Productions at RenaultVP.com. Also, check out our friends at uh, tiny-themovie.com. You can follow them on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, Our music is brought to you by Secrets today. And you can visit our website at intellectualgentlemensclub.com. You can find all the podcast episodes on there. Our links to Stitcher, iTunes, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. We're IGCCast on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook at intellectualgentlemensclub.com. Don't forget to visit the support page. We have our affiliate links on there intellectualgentlemensclub.com backslash support. Until next time, hang loose out there, everyone. The human race is stuck in a giant quagmire when it comes to our behavior and our thinking about our behavior. There comes a certain point in time where you have to pop the training wheels off. And you have to recognize that all this morality that you've developed is good because it's good to treat other people good. It's good to treat other people the way you would like to be treated yourself. It's like a golden rule, and there's a reason for it. And that reason is that we're connected in some strange way that we don't totally understand. And unless you are good to other people around you, unless you're kind and friendly and warm and loving, you're not going to fucking enjoy this life. You're just not. You're going to be problems everywhere you go. You're going to have problems everywhere you go. you got to figure out a way to enjoy this fucking life. That's how you fit in better in the world. That's how you stay positive. We need to figure out, like, now, today, what, what is, you know, the best way to live your life. There's got to be ways where you can be putting forward the most positive energy. I mean, we know objectively what's causing pollution. We know objectively what's causing birth defects and, you know, and we're taking in too much chemicals and not enough vitamins. We know objectively all this stuff. We know how to organize our world, and yet we don't do it. We know how to organize our health, and yet very few people do it. We know all these things. The right path to, like, being a happy, healthy person is to do all the shit that we already know you're supposed to do. Take care of your body. Take care of your health. Take care of your mind, your stress. Meditate, be kind to people. We all know that. I mean, you ask anybody, they know how to get by and to be the most evolved version of you that you can be. I mean, it's not like a, a magical checklist. If you talk to people about it, you say, okay, here, you're, you got a person, you want to improve them. What are the things you're going to do to them? Okay, well, if I was a life coach, the first thing I would say is this guy's got to get on a diet that makes him healthy. I don't mean a diet just to lose weight. I mean just healthy foods in your body. Many, many vegetables. Vegetables, a lot of good quality protein, a lot of water. Stop the sodas. Stop the bullshit. Start working out your body and get a better sense of like how this machine feels when it's moving, it's flowing better, there's less tension in it, your mind feels like relaxed and and you enjoy every single moment of the day better. Step one, everybody knows that step. What's step two? Be cool to people. 
be nice to as many people as you can. Smile as many people as you can. Have them smile back at you. Just do the most you can. Be as nice as you can, you know, and just still manage to not have people walk over you. Just get through this life as nice as you can. What else? Do what you want to do with your life. Don't go be doing something you don't enjoy. Don't get locked into, you know, a, a car that you can't afford and doing something crazy because you need the money. Don't do that. Do what you want to do. What the fuck is it that you really want to do? Because if someone else is doing it, you can do it. Everybody makes their own path through this world, but a lot of people don't follow the path that they really feel pulled to. You know, because for whatever reason, they got negative programming. You know, when they were kids, someone told them they couldn't do it or told them to take the shortcut or, or take the short route. That's a, a sad thing, man. Oh, 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 oh,
Never said I was a gentleman, motherfuckers. Actually.